Hello, I'm Miloš Marjanović. I'll be talking to you today about principle and practical argumentation as part of our module 2 about comparisons. So just a brief part about terminology. We realize that a lot of debaters are using the words like principled argumentation, deontological argumentation, and non-consequentialist argumentation interchangeably with each other. What is lost in this interchangeability is the fact that every argument has their own underlying principle. It's just not sometimes explicitly said by the teams. So let's firstly talk about terminology and principle foundation of arguments. So usually, when people talk about their practical points, they have the underlying principle of utilitarianism under it. They're trying to prove to you that what you should care about is maximizing utility, whether that be in life saved, economic growth, or better lives for the poorest in our society. All of this is assuming and asserting that what we should care about in this debate is utility. And usually, other teams would agree, either implicitly or explicitly, and they will debate in this utilitarian framework. But even though teams are not explicit about it, underneath it all is still a principle, which is utilitarianism. So where this becomes tricky is when one or few teams have arguments stemming from a different moral framework from what we usually see as a default in utilitarianism. As a judge, you need to be open to be convinced by different moral frameworks. Just because in majority of the debates, utility will be most important, doesn't mean it is something that you should default to in judging the debate. You should be open to things persuading you either way by the framework, mechanisms, or analysis they provide. No moral framework can be deemed a priori, superior, or better. So be open to be persuaded by what other teams are attempting to do. For example, in a debate about capital punishment, one side can argue that capital punishment reduces crime. The other side can argue that capital punishment is inhumane and hence immoral. Average reasonable person could be persuaded by both of these and should not a priori credit practical impacts as more important. Common mistake that people are making is to assume that we judged based on utilitarianism. And this is an incorrect way of judging. In most situations, the teams are the ones that need to convince you which moral framework you should take. And this is how you should adjudicate this clash. You evaluate different teams' contribution towards the moral framework clash and see who gets on top by analysis, rebuttal, or any other way of persuasion we covered before. This doesn't always have to be flagged explicitly, and if it's not, you should try looking at uh, implicit concessions and agreements between the teams. For more on what to do in cases where teams do not explicitly clash on metrics, look at our video about Goldilocks intervention done by Techway. But never try to impose your own moral frameworks on the debate. So let's then talk about common ways teams are engaging in this moral framework and common mistakes in evaluating. So common ways teams try to engage in this moral framework is battling over burden and moral consistency. Teams are usually trying to test the limits of each other's principal framework by presenting you with analogous or similar situation uh, that are there to convince you that, that their moral framework uh, is applied to some other similar situation, so it should be applied here as well. For example, uh, teams that want to shift moral framework for, from utilitarianism uh, can say that even in status quo, we are not applying utilitarianism in most cases, like we are currently prohibiting torture, or we are currently having beyond all reasonable doubt as criteria in our criminal justice system, even though if, lowered, uh, the criteria, if we lower the criteria, we might get more guilty people punished. With this, a team is trying to push another team to take a stance on these issues and put the other team in an unfavorable position because they now have uh, they are now forced to either one increase their burden by agreeing to defend these harder instances as well, spend time rebutting these analogies as not relevant for the debate, trying to prove why these are actually consistent with the utilitarian framework, or lastly, concede that utilitarianism isn't and shouldn't be the only metric in the debate. This is, of course, on its own not enough, uh, and teams still need to prove their principal argumentation sufficiently and explain why they fall under the similar set of criteria. Uh, 
where we apply this non-consequentialism paradigm. So, for example, in a debate about targeting civilians that are harboring a terrorist suspect, opposition can show instances in which we don't operate under utilitarian metrics when deciding what is ethical to do in war. For instance, we are not, how do you say, uh, we do not allow torture of terrorist suspects, even if it can get, uh, get us some information that can save lives. They still need to show why targeting civilians that are harboring terrorists fall under the same logic and why we should apply the same standard. Also, this doesn't automatically mean that non-consequentialism becomes the only metric, but actually quite the opposite, that utilitarianism is not the only metric to consider in this debate, which makes their case relevant. There is sometimes an overlap in moral frameworks where both frameworks would say the action or policy is justified or not. Often this part is non-contentious part of the comparison. That's why when comparing consequentialist and non-consequentialist pr uh, principles, a non-consequentialist principle case often has the burden to show that even if the bad consequences occur, we should still do or not do a particular policy. So, for example, even if we have guilty men going free and committing crime, we should still uphold the principle of fair trial and beyond all reasonable doubt. In the real world, we often have different moral frameworks for different situations. So, for instance, in criminal justice, we usually have some form of non-consequentialist principle to a point. And if we are dealing with natural disasters, for instance, we might have a utilitarian framework. The point is, the real world is completely fine to have multiple different moral frameworks for different situations, which means that principles and moral frameworks can coexist, and it's on to a team to tell you why this particular situation should fall under one of them and explain why particularly this one. Obviously, if we have like great philosopher, god, king, debater, who manages to prove that one of the moral frameworks in utilitarianism or non-consequentialism should be the sole metric for viewing every situation we encounter in life and do it in seven minutes, good for them. But reality will be mostly in the middle ground that we have talked about. So let's move on to how to evaluate principle argumentation. So before comparing moral frameworks becomes relevant, we do need to learn how to evaluate if something is actually proven, uh, if somebody's actually proven their principal point. It doesn't really matter who wins the clash on moral framework if your analysis of the argument is lacking or missing. So how do we do it? You should look at it as any other argument. All the rules of judging, like being an average, reason, average reasonable person and aspiring not to intervene whenever possible, still applies to principled argumentation as well. The only difference in this kind of argumentation which makes it hard for most people uh, uh, to judge, is that most mechanisms are likely going to come from moral philosophy, ethics, or philosophy in general. These are, of course, very hard topics. People are spending years and years studying, and that now somebody is trying to condense into a seven-minute speech. That doesn't mean that principal argumentation must sound smart, use sophisticated words, or confuse you for you to buy the logic. Quite the opposite. An average reasonable person, as an average reasonable person, you're open to be persuaded, but the argument still needs to be clear and logical. So whenever somebody is trying to throw around fancy words that doesn't necessarily mean stuff, there is something, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is something fishy there, but be sure to look at the logic itself and break it down uh, to what the person is actually trying to say and actually trying to prove. Just like any other debate argument you're evaluating, if there are logical, re uh, like you're evaluating if there are logical leaps, or does one point flow into the other, and etc. You should also always look at what the teams in the end manage to prove. So for example, when analyzing principle about helping the most disenfranchised groups, oftentimes debaters tend to prove that we should do a thing, but not the thing that the motion is requiring them, whether that's reparations or state or some other policy that we're debating. So for instance, in a debate about giving more votes to women, 
A team might prove that we have obligations to give something to women as a form of reparation for past injustices. But they still need to prove that the thing that we actually need to give them is more votes rather than any other thing that we can do for them. A popular way of explaining and amplifying argumentation is the use of analogies. So we think it's helpful to explain how to evaluate this technique. We, will, we are firstly going to explain what do we mean by the use of analogies and then demonstrate how to evaluate principal arguments that use this technique. So analogies are basically there to show you that the mechanisms uh, provided by the teams are applicable in some real-life situations that are similar, uh, which we already consider immoral or immoral. So for instance, in a debate about legalizing euthanasia, you can link the right to euthanasia to right to refuse medical procedure that can also lead to patient's death. This is very useful when presenting a principal argument, but things that you need to consider when judging it is first, analogies still need explanation and similar levels of explanation that you would expect from people explaining the example that they're giving in any other argument. And the second thing is that analogies are usually not a substitute for analysis. They're there to amplify, to validate some sort of mechanism and logic that happened by the team, but they're not substitution for argumentation, and they're not substituting the logical chain that still needs to happen by the team. This doesn't necessarily mean, all of this doesn't necessarily mean that when you find one of these mistakes that we talked about, this automatically makes the argument invalid. Debate is still about comparisons, which means that you're also, uh, also at a point taking into account what logic and diligence did other teams prove in their points, principle or practical. It is often the case that even if the analysis is missing in some of these layers, uh, that the other teams may have done a worse job. So never dismiss it a priori. There is a spectrum of how much has somebody convinced you into a practical harm. This is not any different to principled argumentation. So let's talk about some principles that are dependent on outcomes. So one common mistake that happens is that sometimes somebody is trying to hide their principle, that their principle is contingent on consequences. This again often happens when people are trying to prove that we have moral obligation to help a certain community. This is fine. This is a good setup, but it's still contingent on proving that the policy that you're proposing is actually helping the community. So what this principal argument does, if done correctly, is to establish a moral framework that we should care mostly about helping this community, which is fine and good, but still opposing team can win without, focusing, uh, without touching this argument by pro proving to you that this policy in fact doesn't help or is actively harmful to this group. Uh, so be actively mindful of what the principal argument is doing. Is it establishing a moral framework? So then we need additional analysis. Or is it actually doing the analysis? So this concludes our lesson about principle and practical argumentation. So let's talk about key takeaways from this lesson. One, every argument has an underlying principle, even though it's hidden sometimes. Two, be open to be persuaded by different moral frameworks and do not assume that the default judging metric is utilitarianism. Three, teams are, teams are going to be battling for, uh, for their moral framework in the debate and always try to see, uh, to, to see uh, are they convincing you into them and never input your own moral framework into the debate. As an average reasonable person, you don't have to you don't have a preformed opinion on consequentialism and non-consequentialism. Uh, you just evaluate it and judge it based on what teams are presenting. And fourthly and lastly, evaluate if the argument is proven just like you would any other argument. Don't fall, the, don't fall for the fanciness of the words, but the logic of the argument. Thank you for watching this video. If you have any questions, you can leave them in comments below or send us an email. There is also an evaluation form for this module that you can look in the description below. Thank you and goodbye.